our August 2013 meeting. This is the last meeting of this year. Our September meeting will start the new year and we'll be collecting dues starting next month. All over again. Right now, just so that you have a heads up, right now the board is uh, awaiting a uh, report from our treasurer. Depending on the report, we may have to increase our dues. Every, prices go up, things cost more. Okay? Are you getting more for money? Excuse me? Are we getting more for our money? No. Larry, you're getting more than you can possibly imagine. <laughs> Explain it. I'll let you do that, Myron. You're much better than that, Mario. Are you saying that? Okay. Uh, w there is a lack of board members here. Therefore, the business meeting will be reduced considerably. Since I'll be re I'll be doing all the parts practically. <laughs> um, First of all, I'm Dick Knopf. Uh, membership, we, we have a survey that, that we got back. We do have results from the survey. Unfortunately, I do not have them with me, so we will skip that part of the... And the survey says? Yes, the survey says. Now, actually, it was a good, um, it was a good uh, uh, response, and we do appreciate it. And at any time, if anybody has any suggestions as to activities, uh, meeting subjects, or if they want to be a speaker, please don't hesitate. We are open to all suggestions, well, almost all suggestions. We had to turn down a couple of them. Uh, anyway, um, at this point, we have a guest here who'd like to speak from Jewish Family Services. David? Yes. I thought she was after membership. <laughs> he told me it is membership. membership. And membership is over. Ann Miller is here from Jewish Family Services. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ann Miller. I'm the Vice President of Jewish Family and Children's Service of Southern New Jersey. Much easier to say JFCS. And um, I thank you very much for inviting me to come. And it's really very nice to look around and see several familiar faces. So I know I only have a few minutes, so I'll try to use them wisely. Um, let me just give you a quick idea of who we are. We are a social service agency, and we uh, take care of people in need throughout the South Jersey area um, through a wide variety of services. And basically, we cover the entire life cycle. So we start with adoption services, and that goes all the way through to extensive senior services. Uh, we have a very large counseling program for adults and children. We have um, a very big special needs program, which includes vocational and recreational activities. Uh, we have a domestic abuse program. Yes, there is a lot of domestic abuse in South Jersey. And um, we have a project called Project Sarah, Stop Abusive Relationships at Home. So we run a program for women and children and men who need it too. So sometimes I know we can abuse you guys. Um, and we have a huge family assistance program. And that includes financial assistance, it includes counseling services, uh, vocational counseling services, and our food pantries. And I know that's the reason I'm really here to speak today about our food pantries. We have three food pantries in the South Jersey area. We are the only kosher food pantries in the area. And we basically uh, run on donations of food, the non-perishable food, and donations of gift cards, because we give people gift cards to buy perishables, because we, we just don't have the room or the way to store all the perishables. What you need to know is, as quickly as the food comes in, it's going out. And the other thing you need to realize is that we're not talking about all these people from Camden who are living over grates coming for food. We are talking about your neighbors in Cherry Hill and Voorhees and surrounding areas who are having tough times. You know, the, uh, the media may talk about economic recovery, 
but there are a lot of people still hurting out there. So even, for example, uh, the divorce rate has gone down because people can't afford to get divorced. The domestic abuse rate has gone up, okay, and the need for counseling has gone up. So we are inundated with people who need help. Um, the reason I'm here today is because we're having a program on September the 15th, right after Yom Kippur. A lot of the synagogues uh, do food drives for the high holidays. And so we get a ton of food in at that time. And we need people to help sort it, get it to the right pantries, and all that kind of work. So I know Mike thought that that might be a good, good uh, idea for this group. We'll be meeting September 15th at 10.30 at McCor Shalom. Um, and I'll tell you in a few minutes how you can RSVP, and I'll give you more information about that. So basically, that's who we are. That's what we do. Um, I know I only had a few minutes this morning, but we, I really, we would welcome the opportunity to come back at a later date and really give you an idea of the programs and services that we have. I mean, for example, there's a Holocaust Survivors Program, which is an amazing program. Um, we are in the midst of a food program. We just cooked uh, at Bethel, Bethel TBS, uh, Hadassah, a few groups got together and we cooked almost 300 meals last week that we're gonna package now on Monday and on Tuesday. We will be delivering hundreds of meals to people in the area who are unable to get out, home alone, isolated, and I have to tell you, it's an amazing feeling to do that. My husband and I do that all the time. Um, so, again, we'd love to be able to come back and tell you more about what we do. We'd love to be able to tell you more about the volunteer opportunities. There's a whole array of volunteer opportunities. And I guess the bottom line is that we can do a lot together through partnerships with groups like South Jersey Men's Club. Um, we would love the opportunity to work along with you, even if there was a group that wanted to visit our family assistance program on Route 70 and just see the food pantry and see how it all works. We'd love to do that too. So I will, um, what I have here is, I didn't know how many people to expect, but uh, maybe you'll just make sure this gets handed out. This just gives you an idea of some of the things that are needed in the food pantry. And then it gives you a phone number at the bottom uh, that you can RSVP if you can come on the 15th of September. And the person you'd want to ask for is Andy Lowe. So somebody should just make a note of that and uh, she's the head of our volunteer program. And this would be a start, and I think that if we you know, develop a partnership, we can help you, you can help us, and I think it could be a, a, a nice, nice experience for all of us. Are there any questions, Mike? Um, what time would it be? 10.30. And how long do you expect it to last? Well, it depends on how many people we get. Um, you know, it could be a couple hours, Maybe they have shifts. I, you know, if you talk to Andy, she's got the whole thing organized. But we're not talking about a whole day or anything. And if you can come for an hour, um, you know, we just sort out the food and we make sure that it gets to the pantries and gets where it has to go. Any other questions about that or any comments? Do you know how many people you're going to need before we start tripping over each other? Well, that's why Andy will coordinate it. That's why she's our, yeah, I don't want to take names. I don't want to do any, let it come through her. She has the whole thing organized, and she'll know how many people she needs at any given time. It's quite possible that we'll coordinate our thing. Right. Instead of just individuals going, I don't know how we'll do it. But. Right. Okay. Okay, but, but work through her. She's your, your her name is Andy. Andy Lowe, A-N-D-I-L-O-E-W. Anybody else? How many, how many people figure you come out? Put your hands up if you're going to help. The 15th is the, it's the Sunday, it's a Sunday, right after Yom Kippur. Okay. So you're starting with a clean slate and you get in there and do some good. But talk to her and see. She may tell you, Mike, that she only needs X number of people, whatever. I don't know. Another question. Yeah. Uh, if, if we at our meetings brought food in, right. where would we leave it? Well, the meetings would be here. It's a great idea. It's a because we we do that for many activities where people just bring some things and um, and it adds up. It's great. 
I'll tell you what you could do. If David takes it, I'll make sure it gets to the right place, or it can go right to the JFCS office, which is um, right as part of the JCC, you know, as you're going down towards Saltzman. It's right on the corner there. So you could take it right there, or I would be more than happy to transport it for you and let them know that that's where it came from. That would be great. We meet every Sunday, at, you know, once a month on a Sunday. Right. If we just brought it to the front desk, any foods that are not current? Well, they're not there on Sunday. Um, I understand yeah. that, but the front desk is there on Sunday. I don't know if some, oh, you're talking about the JCC? Yes. I don't know, we'd have to work that out. But uh, if, if I got the stuff, I would make sure it gets to JFCS. Right. We're talking, we are not the JCC. I understand that. Okay. But you're a division of JCC. No, we're a division of Federation. The Federation. Right, right. <laughs> Our biggest problem is we could have food and he, David may not be here. Oh, okay. You're saying you'll get it eventually, but we don't know how to get it to you. Okay. It's a Sunday morning and we have the food. Well, let's work. see. David lives in my community, right. Mort lives in my community, Sam lives in my community. Right. So, I mean, if, if we can do it that way, I'm trying to make it easier. If you want to get it right to JFCS, I would say maybe Monday morning, take it over to them. That's a problem? We're, we're here on Sunday. Anybody right. Well, worst yeah, comes to, worst comes the worst. We can either arrange to meet you here at a point wherever it is and just transfer the, the goods to our home. Well, for example, yeah. we have leftover books. We just take it down to the front desk. It eventually gets to the library. Right. So I'm wondering if you could work it out with Federation that it eventually gets to you. You know what? I'd be happy to look into it. And and I will get back to, to my... We're probably not talking about a whole lot of food. If everybody just brings like, you know, one can or something. Right, or a box of pasta, right? Exactly. We're not talking about tons of food. I so understand. So I have a feeling that leaving it at the desk downstairs and eventually on Monday you pick it up would probably be the thing that would work. Right, well, let, let me look into it and see if we can do that because I don't want to put that on the JCC either. You know, uh, so. Put it on. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions or anything? Well, again, thank you very thank much. Thank you. And I uh, hope we can develop Thank you, Eric. Oh, thank you. This is very nice. Okay. Mike Perloff is going to burst if I don't let him talk. So, Mike. Tell us about Nelson. Boom! I burst. <laughs> uh, Nelson Mellis, as you know, is a retired Air Force Colonel. Woo! <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Yeah, I got their attention, didn't he? Uh, he retired uh, Air Force Colonel, and he's active in the Jewish War Vets, and he's the outgoing New Jersey commander of the Jewish War Vets. Are in the middle. Of Benches down in Richmond for the entire uh, country. And also, received awards the outstanding state commander. So I think that's something we all need to know. Thank you, Mike. Well, let's get to some of the other things first. Um, we've got a lot of stuff on the agenda here. Unfortunately, it's mostly penciled in from what Don originally gave me. Um, every year, the JCC builds a sukkah. Uh, you see it out front. This year, it's scheduled to be put together on the 11th of September, rain date the 12th. I'm going to pass around uh, a, a sheet for volunteers. They start at about 10, roughly about 10 in the morning, let me just double check my notes. Yeah, it starts about 10, it should be done by noon, and they will serve, uh, usually they, they, they provide pizza for the volunteers who, who uh, assist. Uh, like I said, I'll pass around a sign-up sheet for that. Um, the more the merrier, it's not hard work, and if you're, if you're real careful, you won't get hit in the head. Uh, we were supposed to get a report uh, from uh, Barry Rosenberg on JAG participations. 
But one of the things that is coming up is uh, you may and you, you you may have received flyers on it. It's called Tour de Schools. It is a fundraiser for Camp Roma, and this year it's going to be held here in New Jersey, and they're looking for volunteers to assist with it, and they're looking, you know, we're going we're gonna to have a team, uh, Alan Finkelstein is going to be the team leader, uh, he's looking for participants who want to uh, ride on the South Jersey Men's Club team. So I will be passing a sheet around for that. Um, it's September 22nd. Basically, the, the, there will be three circuits. There will be a short circuit, which will run from Bethel to TBS. There will be a long circuit, which runs from Bethel, I believe, to uh, Beth Tikva and back again. And then there will be the longest circuit, which is Beth El to Beth Tikva twice. Okay. Um, oh, if you wish to, you can sponsor a writer. It's uh, simply by going online. Uh, there, there's a place to click on for a donation. Uh, website will be uh, will will be in the material that's being disseminated. And it's very simple to do. Um, we've contributed in the past. We, meaning myself, I know Mike has, uh, and several other people uh, in support of our participants. For those of you who are unaware, we have uh, mitzvah cards that we distribute. You contact um, Len Berman, and uh, for like three dollars, he will send out a card for uh, happy events, for sad events. You just let him know, give him the information, and he'll send it out. Money will be collected by the treasurer, and it, it goes into our mitzvah fund to uh, pay for various uh, events and contributions. Um, no, just a heads up, our November meeting has been moved to the 14th, I believe, or 17th, 17th. Um, reason for that is, is that our program is going to involve uh, the ABC, the uh, Arts, Books, and Culture Festival. Um, they're they're going to have three speakers who are authors of three uh, 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 different books. Um, and that information will be, again, disseminated. We, we have until November. But just so that you understand, we're going to have our breakfast here. We're not going to have a speaker for November will retire downstairs to, the, uh, to where the uh, speakers will be. The idea is we'll show up at about 11. We'll help set up for their brunch, which is going to be a very simple setup. Uh, at 11.30, they start their series. Um, they're going to have classic cake for dessert versus entomins that we have. So you can, you know, one, one step up for the dessert We'll be charging $10 for our breakfast here, but that will, that will include a ticket to go downstairs for the, uh, for the speakers. The ticket normally is $10 by itself, so you're getting a deal, okay? But we'll talk about more, that more at, uh, at subsequent meetings. Uh, let me see, what else? Uh, for those who are in the fantasy football, we, the draft is tomorrow night. Ed Silver, uh, JCRC report, please. If you had the time, I'll yield the floor back to you. <laughs> oh, you have nothing to say about JCRC? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. How about the Bible study update? 
I knew I could get you out of your seat for something. I was going for sex the next time. <laughs> I'm a married man. To a Jewish woman, there isn't. <laughs> but you have an imagination. Oh, is that on tape too? <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of there, Bob. In view of the uh, lack of uh, turnover of interest in providing some issues, we're not going to have any formal Bible study. However, the Men's Sub does know these tapes and a very educational informant. And uh, anybody who actually wants to borrow them, um, I'll make sure that for every meeting after you today, I'll have them with me. And you can, uh, it'll be like a library station. Um, yes, so I'll. And if you need to even borrow longer, because there are uh, about 20 different half hour presentations, you may need it longer. Uh, due to the fact that I'm up here, uh, I'm also on the board of the uh, Super Sunday program, they call it the uh, Campaign Cabinet. And um, I've given feedback to the uh, Campaign Cabinet about the relative discomfort and resistance to making phone calls. And apparently they're taking it seriously. I don't think it's just because it's mine, so they're not going to do it. So the, uh, there's going to be a concerted effort in the future to use more email and mail. Uh, Avian went out last time about avoiding the phone call, meaning on Super Sunday you may not get the phone call. Uh, if there's enough response to that, there's going to be less and less reliance on phoning people. So um, let's see how well they do in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Mike? You want to talk about the uh, convention, please? please. I'd say he's playing with his phone. He's always playing with his phone. Memory. His memory. <laughs> he has none. He does not. There's a name when you lose your memory. I don't remember what it's called now. Dementia. Of course not. The convention of the International Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs, of which we've been a member for actually 22 years. 22 years as the South Jersey Men's Club, and then a few years before that as the Men's Club of Bet Jacob at Israel. We had this convention that happened every two years. The last one was in Boston at the end of July this year. There were uh, 550 men representing men's clubs from the United States, Canada, a few from Europe, Israel, and South America. It was uh, extraordinary. And the programming was marvelous. Uh, I recommend the next one, which may also be on the West Coast in two years, that our officers will make every attempt to go because you will come back with ideas that will make our club even better than it is. The main thing that struck me that will impact on our men's club was a presentation a sign sheet, no about pen. what makes people want to be members of an organization. And you have to feel that it's relevant, it's relevant and that you have some equity into it, so to speak. And for that reason, we're going to be doing more things to make people feel that they have a stake in the success of the South Jersey Men's Club. Now, the interesting thing is that most of these presentations are online already. And I'll give the links to uh, Randy to send out so you can look at the presentations yourself. I was fortunate enough that I received an award. And if you get the voice, it's on this little story on page three. It was for Israel advocacy. Nobody? The speaker today that we had about the Jewish Family again. Service and the food drive and the needs they have, that's also in the voice of this issue on page eight. Any questions about the convention? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Um, I got two sign-up sheets here. One is for the sukkah. The other one is for the tour de shuls. So I'll pass these around. Um, basically, these are to get an idea. Uh, what we'll do is we'll send out emails to those people who sign up. Uh, you want to participate, you'll have all the information you need. Okay? Uh, now, what I'd like to do is introduce Mr. David Schwartz, who is our programming vice president, who will introduce our speaker.
Thank you, Bob. Good morning. We're, we're honored to have a very interesting speaker this morning who happens to be a member of our men's club. And uh, even not having heard his presentation, we've made the decision to have him back in the uh, future for another meeting, for another presentation. I think you're going to find his uh, experience in the military very interesting. And I'm going to turn it over to Gordon Bacher. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Right. What the first thing I want to do is ask each and every one of you, how many of you believe in miracles? Raise your hand. Do you believe in miracles? Okay. I wasn't sure until 1977, and then I witnessed one. And that's what this presentation is about. Before we get to that, the first thing I want to do is go over some of my own personal background so you know how I got to this situation that I'll be talking about today. Then we'll talk about the actual rescue itself. And then finally, some of the personal observations I made after, after completing this mission. <clears throat> first, my personal history. In uh, 1966, I was a graduate student at Ohio State University. And that was uh, right after they started increasing our involvement in Vietnam. And those of you who are old enough to remember, I think just about everybody is, we had a two-tier draft system. If you were in school, you could avoid the draft. And if you weren't in school, you were sent over to fight in Southeast Asia. Very, very unfair, and I really believe that a lot of, lot of the political problems we have today emanates from that decision to have a two-tier draft system. At any rate, I was getting very uncomfortable, me personally, with my sense of values, taking on a draft deferment while I was a graduate student at Ohio State. So in 1967, I told them to take their deferment, put it where the sun don't shine. And I started to investigate uh, entry into the United States Air Force. I passed the exams, and I was accepted into the United States Air Force, and I <clears throat> took my oath of office on 2 January 1968. I went immediately to officer training school. Uh, and three months later, a 90-day wonder, I was given my uh, gold bar as a second lieutenant, went off to pilot training, and I washed out after about five or six uh, months because my air work wasn't sufficient. And so they sent me off to navigator school at Mather Air Force Base in the fall of 1968. That's about a year's program. And in uh, September of 1969, I got my silver wings as a navigator. And my first duty assignment <clears throat> was a C-119 gunship, the Shadow. I completed my uh, final check ride on December 18, 1969. <clears throat> Excuse me. And before I went overseas, I went had, had to be looked at by a doctor because during survival training, I had an accident, I had to see the flight surgeon. This was in Spokane, Washington. And he noticed a lump in my neck, a goiter. And he said, that has to come out before you go to Southeast Asia. So on December 18th, I took my check ride. And about five or six hours after the check ride, which was at the Lock One Air Force Base in Columbus, Ohio, I went down to Wright Patterson, the medical center. And on, on December 19th, I saw the, the uh, surgeon, December, uh, uh, the next day, they took out the goiter and they sent it off to the lab at Ohio State and came back with follicular and medullary cancer. And so <clears throat> back I went on the surgery and radiation treatment. And to make a long story short, I was mustered out of the Air Force uh, 7 April 1970 with temporary disability retirement list with 100% disability. And it was about the lowest point in my life because they had cut out a large part of my left neck, my left shoulder over here, and I'm left-handed. And <clears throat> I, was, I was physically debilitated, and I couldn't complete what I had trained to do. That really 
maybe quite depressed. And instead of mulling about it, the first thing I did when I got home, I spoke to my father who owned a manufacturing plant. And I said, Dad, I want to go to work. I want to work on the line to build my strength back up. So my father put me on the line. His foreman was an old Marine named Ike. And he worked me like a broke thick mule. But I got my strength back. While I was working there, I also went back to school. I went to uh, Long Island University, and I took four courses of math to complete my minor in math. And, and I will tell you this, not as a matter of bragging, but as a matter of some part of the story. I broke the curve in all four courses. Um, I also taught math for a local, high, a local junior high school, seventh, eighth grade math. Well, uh, January 1970, uh, 71, excuse me, I get a letter from my roommate from NAV school, uh, a gentleman named Andy Stone, excuse me, Andy uh, Steele, and Andy tells me that the Air Force is taking people back who've had cancer. I said, okay, let me try it. Make a very long story short, I called down to the Surgeon General's office in San Antonio, Texas, and they went ahead and started the process. And eight months later, I was taking a physical at McGuire Air Force Base, we're here in New Jersey, passed it with flying colors, and on 10 November 1971, I re-ended extended active duty. I gave up 100% disability to come back onto extended active duty. And my duty assignment was the AC-130 gunship, this puppy right over here. That's the symbol for the Spectre uh, organization. I flew 127 combat rides. I'm telling this for a reason, and you'll, you'll understand in a second. Flew 127 combat rides. I was shot down on 10, uh, to me, uh, on 18 June 1972. I'm one of three survivors of Spectre 1-1. Um, I earned two distinguished flying crosses, eight air medals, and the Purple Heart my year over there. Get out of Southeast Asia and I go and become an instructor navigator at Mayfield Air Force Base in California for four and a half years. I am the top rated instructor in the end of 1976 I took the LSAT exams, got in the top 10% of the country and was accepted to McGeorge School of Law uh, right outside of Sacramento. And so I put in my DOS and they asked the Air Force to have my freedom so I can go to law school. And you know what the Air Force told me? Eh, ain't happening. There were so many pilots and navigators leaving the service. They said, we cannot afford to lose you. So you are going to go to Kirkland Air Force Base. You will become a rescue navigator and you will fly rescue for the next three years. And I saluted and said, yes, sir. That gets me to Kadena Air Base. That was my duty assignment. Get to Kadena, and one of the, one of the, this is a combined squadron with both helicopters and fixed wing aircraft. Our helicopter is the HH-53 Super Jolly and the fixed wing is the HH-130. Our job is to escort, one of the jobs we did was to escort the helicopters in various and sundry missions. We got assigned to a practice combat situation in the Philippines, and what we did there was we basically bore holes in the sky uh, for about six hours, escorting our chopper all over the Luzon, and if, if one, of the, one of the pilots who were actually flying practice combat in the F-4s, F-15s, and the fast movers goes down, we will be there to help them out. Well, the weather was getting really, really bad. The end of our tour was, at the end of this particular mission was about six o'clock in the evening, local time. And that's when the call came in. Meanwhile, while I'm working this mission, 
my radar is almost unusable. It is absolutely washed out. Just, I don't need it particularly for this particular mission because we're over land and, and there are other aids that I use to fix the airplane. But it, it was really bad. The weather is coming in hor horrible weather, really low ceilings, low visibilities. And the call comes in from Rescue Coordination Center, the RCC. And there is a lady on the island of Batan. I don't know if you can see this map or not. I'm going to hold it up. If you look at the very top, the top island is the island of Batan. Where my finger is right now. And we're over here. The distance, so you know what the distances are. From the top of Luzon to Batan, it's 155 nautical miles. We have to escort this chopper to the island of Batan to pick up a pregnant lady who's very pregnant, suffering from, among other things, beach, a breach birth, needs a cesarean, and the only place they can give her what she needs is the hospital in Manila. Now, we can't land on the island of Bataan because there are no airfields there. They've never even seen an aircraft, let alone uh, what we flew. But they did have a soccer field. So we were directed to the soccer field on the island of Bataan to escort this chopper, the HH-53 Super Jolly, to the island of Bataan, pick this lady up, and bring her back through the island of Luzon to Manila. Well, by the time we get out there, it's about 8.15 or 8.30 at night. It's dark and a well big as ass out there. The weather has all moved in. The chopper lands on Bataan and proceeds to put this pregnant lady aboard the aircraft. But this lady has never seen an aircraft, let alone an H.H. -H 53 Super Jolly. How big is an HH-53 Super? Its wingspan is 66 and two-thirds feet from wingtip to wingtip. That's the rotary wing. It weighs 44,500 pounds and it's still the fastest chopper that has ever been in our system. It's got two humongous engines on the top. Well, they throw this lady aboard the chopper and she screamed her head off because she thinks this thing is going to eat her. <laughs> She's never seen an aircraft before. So she screaming her head off and, and the, the, the town leader doesn't know what to do. So he says, I got an idea. Let's throw the husband on because he's the one that got her pregnant. He should ride with her. So they take this poor son of a bitch and they throw him aboard the chopper. And he is just as scared as his wife. Now his wife is in the right side gurney, the two gurneys on a, on, a, on a super jolly, the right side, left side. They put this poor lady on the right side gurney, they give him a stool, and he's sitting there in the stool between the two gurneys holding his wife's hand like this. And he has his eyes closed, tight, shut. He doesn't want to see what's going on. And away we go. It is now about 9 o'clock in the evening. We finally got on board. And now we have to go and go through Luzon. Now, what I neglected to tell you, and what I'm going to tell you right now, the instant, the very instant, they called us and activate us on a real rescue mission. Our call sign changes from King to Air Force Rescue. The Jolly's call sign changes from Jolly to Air Force Rescue and the last five digits of, of the aircraft number. And the reason the Air Force does that is because when you are Air Force Rescue, except for Air Force One, you have the highest priority among all air traffic controllers. And that was the miracle. The, the, day, the, the second 
that RCC activated us and we accepted it and we became Air Force Rescue in our last five digits, my radar came up gangbusters. It was the best radar I have seen 3,500 hours of Navigator. You could paint the crap on a mosquito's tushy from 30 miles on that puppy. That's how acute it was. Now, we get this chopper taken off. Now, we're up about six or 7,000 feet. We're above the weather. These guys are at 1,800 feet. Why? Because if this lady goes above 1,800 feet, she starts bleeding from the vagina. Because the ambient air pressure, the higher you go, the less the air pressure. She, and, and they found out the hard way that the highest she can go is 1,800 feet. Well, we're about halfway between Batan and Luzon, and the chopper informs us, hey, we're almost out of fuel. <coughs> okay, what are we gonna do? We gotta in-flight refuel them. Our minimums to do in-flight refueling is one more nautical mile in trail. That's Air Force Reg 60-16. So now we start lining up for in-flight refueling. And the way we do this, we put the chopper at 1,800 feet, and then we come in behind, we come around and back, and we come right from behind them at 1,600 feet. We're 200 feet below them, and, and I drive the airplane so that this the chopper comes out on the left side of our airplane. That's where the uh, the drone and the hose comes out. And the way I do this is I take the cursor, the radar cursor, and I put it on the heading that I want to fly, and I track, the, I track make sure we, the heading of, the, of my aircraft results in tracking that helicopter down the left side of that cursor. Okay. Lined up perfectly, and we're ready to go. And I tell my pilot's name, Randy Dill. And away we go. I got them lined up, I got them perfect on the, on the radar. I call five miles of trail, Randy says no joy. I call four miles of trail, no joy. Three miles of trail, no joy. Two miles of trail, no joy. One mile of trail, no joy. Half mile of trail, no joy. Quarter mile of trail, no joy. And, and Randy turns back to me and he looks back at me, he says, Box, that's my nickname, is Box. Are you sure you got him? I said, Randy, just drive a fucking airplane. And he does. 100 meters, finally, they see this one, this HH, huge aircraft, finally lit up at 100 meters. And it's perfect. Absolutely, you couldn't have put it one inch better position than it was. We drive past them, the chopper drops down. And what it looks like is this. So you can all see it. Can you all see that? How that hose comes out of the left side? Okay. The chopper flies the probe, the back end of the, of the drogue. The drogue has a female fitting, the, the, the probe has a masculine fitting. They come together and they lock and we get a green light in both, 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 both aircraft, and we start the refueling. When the, the chopper is totally refueled, excuse me, then we go ahead, brake, we race ahead of the chopper, and we get out of his way, and we climb, go back to our safe altitude, he's back at his 1,800 feet, and away we go to Luzon. From the time the chopper called, low fuel, to the time he sucked up, 9,500 pounds of JP-4 was less than nine minutes. The best, the single best, and in any of weather conditions I've ever run, the best refueling thing I have ever run, ever. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> now we're on our way to Luzon. Next problem is, okay, Look at my hand. Lose on a shape like my hand. Put this down for a minute. Okay, can you still hear okay? Okay, up here is the tan. 
what we're going to do is come down the Nine Gulf. This is the Golden Nine Gulf. <coughs> we're going to come through here into the Gulf of, of, Gulf of Manila, Manila Gulf, and then into uh, Manila Bay, rather, and then right into the uh, Manila Airport. The problem when you see this, okay, may I have that for a second? Thank you. Is high terrain. Okay. <coughs> There's a thing called, and I'm going to get this exactly right, minimum optical clearance altitude. Do you know what the minimum, uh, the MOCA is? What, what, let's call it the MOCA. Do you know what the MOCA is for Luzon? 6,000 feet. Where's our chopper? 1,800 feet. Now, <clears throat> we don't have enough gas to go around Luzon and come back up this way. There is, there's not enough gas on both airplanes. Remember, we were doing practice rescue for six hours before we got activated. So what do we have to do? We have to go through the island of Luzon. Now you can do that, but you ain't gonna do it in a straight line. We break in on the, the Gulf of uh, Lungayan Gulf, and as we're approaching, I say to Randy, I says, give me Victor One. That's the VHF radio number one. Now pilots are very reluctant to give up their frequencies. But Randy, <clears throat> Bless his soul, saw the, the wisdom of that. Because I'm going to be giving this guy a whole bunch of vectors to go through this island, and I don't want to have to do it through a pilot who may get a number wrong. I want to talk directly to him. And so he turns over Victor One. And then started the longest hour of my life. Fix the airplane, fix the chopper, turn the chopper. Fix the airplane. Fix the chopper, turn the chopper. And chopper pilots normally like their headings in five degree increments because they're kind of slow. Little joke. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, that's, why I that's why I dedicated this, this that you didn't hear it. I dedicated this briefing to you because of your son. Yeah. Uh, at any rate, that night, those chopper pilots were getting headings to a half a degree. And it would be like this. I would say, uh, Air Force Rescue with his number, turn right, heading, one five and one half, report established heading, one five and one half. And he'd say, flying, one five and one half. Because it was so black out there, he couldn't see the light at the end of the probe of his own chopper. That's, I mean, when you, it was literally zero, zero. And I must have given that guy about 30 vectors as I took him down through Luzon. Now, Luzon also has some other surprises, too. You ever been out west where you see these big things that stick out in the middle of, out of nowhere? You know, out west, these, I mean, like, like, little, like, I don't know what they're called. Yeah, yeah, just like stalactites or whatever you want to call them. Rock formations. Rock formations, thank you. Well, Luzon's got those too, believe it or not, in some of your low lying areas. So you had to fly them through between those guys because they were a lot higher than 1,800 feet. Meanwhile, we finally break, break uh, out of Manila Bay. We're home free. I can turn them over to, the, to approach and be done with the mission. Except the chopper pilot says to me, he's, he says, Nav, we want an airborne radar approach. We don't want to talk to Manila approach. I said, okay. I got a radar that going gangbusters. So I get the chopper headed toward, toward the airport. I find the airport. I, I'm now painting the radar reflectors like nobody's business. I set my cursor up on the runway heading, and I fly the chopper to the cursor. And I kill the drift, and I take him down slowly uh, on, on a graduated uh, glide path. Right, in, He didn't see the ground until he was inside, a, okay, or just under 100 feet above the ground. That's the first time he saw the ground. And I took him all the way in. Get on the ground. The ambulance comes, takes the lady and her husband off. Meanwhile, we scoot back to uh, uh, Clark Air Base in the Philippines, and about an hour later, the chopper crew comes in, and we get the word, mother and son doing well. 
Save them both. Now, let me tell you a couple things about the end of this mission. <clears throat> we got together at the, at the club. The co-pilot of the chopper was the resource manager for the helicopter pilots. I was the navigator resource manager. I can't tell you before this time how many times we bumped heads on training time. He didn't want one hour going to the navigator training time. He thought it was more important for the helicopter pilots to get their training. So I turned to him and I said, are we going to have this argument again about navigator training time? No. <laughs> that, was, that argument ended that night. I also heard from the flight engineer of the chopper, and he told me something that was really hilarious. Remember that really scared husband? And he's sitting there, right? And he has his eye closed, and he's just like this. Well, when does this poor son of a bitch decide to open his eyes? Right in the middle of the refueling procedures. So he looks outside the screen, and what is he seeing? He sees the flight engineer, he sees the two pilots, and ASNC-130 lit up like a Christmas tree. And the scream that emanated from his mouth was so loud, they heard it above the, 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 the roar of the engines and, the, and the, 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 the headset that they were wearing. The loudest scream the flight engineer has ever heard in his entire life. So, okay, some other things. Uh, the next day, when I flew, that radar was worthless. Absolutely worthless. I read next to the airplane. That, that radar came up when our call sign was Air Force Rescue, and I'll be damned if I can tell you how that happened. I, well, I didn't touch it. That's one. Number two, when my father passed in 1984, he had in his, in his wallet the news clipping from that rescue mission. And it always gave me some measure of comfort knowing that my dad was proud of me. Because we're all Jewish here, I think we're all Jewish. And, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I, I think our, one, of our, one of our main tenets of our life, of our religion, is to save a life, is to save the world. That night, my crew and I saved two lives. The other thing I want to bring up, and this is why I told you about what my personal history was. I was really angry at the Air Force for not letting me go to law school. I thought I earned the right to, you know, to, to leave the service because I served, I served honorably in combat. I had, thought I had the right to you know, pursue what I wanted to pursue. They saw it differently because the needs of the country were greater than my needs. But when I fully retired in 2008, at my son's behest, I wrote a book which is called Ghost Rider in the Sky about some of the things that happened to me. It's, it's the only part of it is that, that makes it a novel rather than history is the fact I changed some of the, character, the, the, the characters that, 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 that affected my life a little bit. But the main part of the story and what happened to me is, is exactly what happened. That's what made it easier to write because why do we just tell them what happened? The, the point is, it gave me a chance to reflect on my own life. And I thought about this mission, because I wrote about the mission in the book. And there was no other navigator in that squadron qualified to do what I did. First of all, they couldn't do an ARA. That's, a, that's something we only do in training. Most of those guys were so far removed from their training, they wouldn't remember how to do it. Um, I was also, four and a half years, as an instructor navigator, I learned every phase of navigation. I became an expert in every single phase. And the, one of the guys in the Rescue Coordination Center, because we were getting evaluated by wing, was Colonel Frank Watkins, my boss. And I was the only navigator who he would allow that mission to go forward. Had I not been on that airplane, the, the RCC would not, have, would not have issued the order. They would not have put the plane at risk. So it was 
the fact that the Air Force didn't let me go oh, and, and caused me some personal pain. But looking back on it now, I wouldn't trade that mission for all the law degrees this side of Harvard. Frankly, I, I would rather do that mission than, than have anything else. And I thank you very much. Are there any questions? Did you go to law school? No, I did not. By the time I, by the time I got out of the, the uh, I left the Air Force in 1980. In fact, that's one of the one, one of the things I was going to tell Dave. Um, the next time I talk to you, I will tell you about the last active duty mission that I flew, which was trying to save the uh, the hostages in Iran. Wow. That was the last one. That was my last bite of the apple. I lived through some really exciting times in the 12 years I was in the service. That aborted mission that in the desert? You got it. You, you, that, that's what you're going to hear about the next time. Sir? You, I thought you said you got out of the Air Force in 2008 and the reserve. No, no. I, I retired from all, from, 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 actually from Lockheed Martin. I, 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 retired, I, I, I just retired from working in 2008. Okay, because the satellite was still concerned. Oh, no, 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 no. I, well, what, what, I, I spent 27 years in air traffic control. It was also federal service. And the three years with Lockheed doing air traffic, uh, uh, but with them with quality assurance engineering. Gotcha. What made the uh, project so important? The one woman giving birth to the uh, I, 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 you know, that that's a question you got to ask Frank Watkins. Um, it, it, it was, I never thought about it, and I was quite willing to risk my life to save hers and that baby. I, I know the guys in the chopper felt the same way, because that's, that's where they are rescued. Yeah, it's also, let me just mention one other thing, too. I, I, it's something I want to direct to Bill in particular. There are enlisted men in, in the, um, in rescue, called pararescue. How many of you guys ever heard of them? Well, now that they call them PJs. PJs, well, that's the that, that, yeah, okay. I, I just want you to know, in the annals of the United States Air Force, maybe in the whole military itself, there are no higher decorated group of men anywhere than the pararescue guys. Um, they, they, it, they're the most amazing group of men, and it's that attitude permeates all rescue. Yet yeah, they're just a spear end of it. And that's why they, that's why they go. Because if we didn't do that baby dies. And the baby dies. Sir. This is for probably a philosophical philosophical argument. You saw an inequality about the draft from educated people in college versus the uneducated. What about the draft itself? For example, your girlfriend, your wife, your sister, your mother, nobody had a, in that group had to face the draft. The Constitution has an argument about involuntary servitude. If there was no draft, would we have been in Vietnam? Uh, very good question. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question, but I, but I do agree with you, your premise. I think the draft is in either draft everybody or nobody. That's, your, that, that's my opinion. And I love the uh, volunteer service. I think it's the, the, the best thing since, since uh, some Jewish lady made chicken soup. <laughs> uh, in other words, you're saying something like Israel that has basically universal draft, with some exceptions. But my question is, throughout your career in the military, uh, did being Jewish impact in any way? Um, not, not really. Um, I, it was. Um, when I flew gunships, my nickname was the Rabbi of the Booth. <laughs> and uh, and if, you, if you come to my house, I will actually show you my combat um, dog tags. And on my combat dog tags is a gold Jewish star. So I want people to know I was Jewish. Uh, and I, I tell you, most of the guys I flew with were either Catholic or born again. And I had no problem with those guys. And also, when I was in combat, there's only two things that people judge on combat. Are you competent, and do you tell the truth? And I was a um, slick wing captain when I, went, when I went into gunships. They had me as a sensor operator. I said, I want to be a fire control officer. 
they, I not only blew their stocks up because I was so good at what I did, I became the flight examiner of FOCO. Uh, and I was the ju most junior FOCO in the squadron. And I was telling lieutenant colonels and majors how to do their job. And they were listening and doing it. Because in combat, that's all you care about is competency. Sir? What was the highest rank you achieved? Uh, in active duty, captain, and then major uh, in the reserves. Well, I'm going to say, when I just went back out to see my son back in June, I was there for his promotion to major. And at the same time, he picks up another air medal. He's picked up, he's got a ton of air. You talk about what you were saying about those helicopter pilots. He's got a ton of air medals. I remember the first one he, uh, that he rescued a guy out in Washington State there with his soldier, three of them. They managed to get one of them out. The other two had passed, had died on him. But the one that was a little alive, they pulled him out, they got him out. They gave him uh, an air medal, they even wrote an article about it, I have it. And then when he did the second one, where he got the distinguished flying course with Fallon, he sent me the article. I printed it and I got it. And he, like I said, I went into his closet when he was in on a medal like this, yeah. he even gave us one of them. He says, here, yeah, take this all out. And the day he got to be a major, I think he, he was supposed to get two or three. He says, just an ounce one. He says, I don't want it. And uh, that's what they did. They gave him one more air medal. Right? So I don't know what he's gotten since. They never asked him. Yeah. Um, like I said, this is, um, I have a lot of respect for the guys that flew, flew rescue. Um, I was picked up in the Oshawa Valley on June 19, 1972. Uh, in fact, there's kind of a funny story about that. The, the PJ, who was manning the lines, uh, when, they, they, when, you, when they take you up through the, the, with the tree, tree penetrator, you, you hook that around you and they pick you up. Uh, when you get past the trees, next thing you're up to 6,000 feet because nothing climbs as fast as an HH-53 helicopter. The new stallions they have right now, a nice airplane, couldn't touch a, couldn't hold a candle to the old Super Jolly. At the most overpowered airplane ever, you know, as, as, as a helicopter. And that puppy goes 6,000 feet, nothing flat, and you're hanging on to this thing. And then he, he rings you up, he brings you up, and then he pushes you away from the airplane, and then as you come back in toward the open door, he releases the, the line, and you bounce it. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> little, little bouncing ball of navigator. And, uh, and then and you, you just sit there holding to this thing. He, he taps you on the arm three times, shoulder three times, and, and now you, 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 you release your death grip on, on the tree, tree penetrator. And, and what I did when I got up, we got free of the tree penetrator. I went right to that PJ and I kissed him on the cheek. That's the only time I ever kissed a man. Now, when I got to Kadena, this is, Years later, so 72, when I was shot down, I was a cadena in 77. Five years later, I found that PJ. And he asked him, I said, Sergeant, how many guys have you kissed? He said, well, about half the guys. So I felt a little better. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, gentlemen? No. Lord, before you go. Oh. Wait, wait, wait for the cameraman to get his camera. <laughs> <laughs> I hope there's more coffee over there. Oh, there's always coffee. Okay, okay. good. Okay. All right. Well, That's for you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you. Oh, thank you very, very much. One more duty that you have. <laughs> stir him up. They <laughs> didn't stir it up. If you pick your number, that's all right. Okay. First number is three. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's blue. Second number is seven. I'm a winner so far. Next number is five. Two. All right. Eight. Done. What's the number? Six. No. Cheap, cheap. What's the number? What's the number? 286. 286. 286 is the number. Yeah. Somebody should be. It's got to be over here somewhere. What, what number is it? 286. 286. I had it. Of oh, course. Right. Good for you. Yeah. You get this bag of empty. Uh... <laughs> I get to put it. $31. Wow. 
Morty. All right. The winner. Very good, Morty. All right. Everybody the three years I have a winner.